if you will, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 17. Um, this passage has been very influential in my life ever since I was a young teenager. Um, the book of Timothy was written to a young man in the ministry by Paul to Timothy as he was beginning, uh, as he was in the ministry in the church of Ephesus. And it's always an encouragement to a young man in whatever capacity uh, to see how God can use us regardless of where he has us. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll read uh, verses 14 through 17, and then I'll pray and we'll jump in. Verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for another opportunity to open your word and share your truth with your people. I pray that you would give me the words to speak today, and that uh, they be a blessing, in, uh, despite my shortcomings. In your name I pray, amen. Have you ever heard the statement, life is a game? Life is a game. That was a popular catchphrase a few years ago. Um, I know I said that once to a young lady, a friend of mine, when I started school, and she was very offended by it. Because usually when people say life is a game, what they're trying to say is have fun, live it out to the best, try to win at whatever you're doing, even at the... Um, uh, I'm not coming up with the word now. Even if it's not good for others, try to get ahead however you can. Play the game. And in that sense, the phrase is not very applicable. But there is a comparison that can be made between life and between a game. Now, I love games. I love all sorts of games. Um, and I realized that games have two necessary parts, right? Every game that you play, you are required to make some sort of decision that makes some sort of impact on the outcome of the game. Whether it's you're rolling dice, you're drawing cards, you decide whether to move your pieces here or there. What you do can affect the outcome of the game. And the second essential part of a, any game is a rule book. When I was younger, I got this set of green army men, green plastic army men. And I was encouraged by my father to try and come up with some game that I could play. And the hardest part with creating a new game was to come up with the rule book. Thankfully, we don't have to come up with the rule book to life. We have the rule book right here. God gave us the rule book. Similarly to a game, our decisions throughout life have an impact in what, we, uh, what results around us. We impact our life with our decisions. We impact the people around us with our decisions. So it's important that we make decisions based on the rules that God outlined for our life, that we follow His rule book. In a game, decisions have temporal consequences. The consequences end as soon as the game is done. If I make a bad decision, if I do something foolish um, that hurts me or hurts my teammate or hurts another player, the moment the game's over, that's it. But in life, decisions and actions have eternal consequences. It's impossible to please God without, with our lives, making our decisions to please God, unless we have a guide to tell us what God wants from us, which is why we have the Bible. So we need to understand the purpose and the value of, a Bible, of the Bible. So with that in mind, 2 Timothy kind of outlines how we're supposed to use God's Word in our lives. So a little bit about the book of 2 Timothy. It's believed that 2 Timothy was one of the last books Paul wrote before he died. He wrote it to Timothy, a young pastor, 
a young minister. And we need to recognize the fact that though this book had a very specific audience, had a very specific person with a very specific situation, to whom, a specific person to whom it was written, a specific situation that it addresses, it still has immense amounts of value for our lives. No, we might not live in the ancient world. We might not be pastors in the ancient city of Ephesus to believers uh, centuries and millennia ago. But still, there are timeless truths in this book that we can learn and profit from. One of the key themes of this book is faithfulness. Paul encourages Timothy throughout the book, continue in what has been taught. Continue doing what you're doing, despite discouragements, despite oppression, despite influences to the contrary. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, we'll discuss it in a moment. Chapter 3, the setup for this passage, begins with Paul warning Timothy about false teachers. Which is what brings us to verse 14, uh, where he says, But continue thou. God's word is the instruction manual in our life. And we, we know that it's necessary for our life. The question is, how can we faithfully follow God's word? And that's the first step. Continue in God's word. Now, what does this mean? First of all, we need to recognize that this command applies to all of us despite where we are in our spiritual lives. Continue in God's word. It's interesting, in verse 15, Paul says, "...and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures." We know the testimony of Timothy that from a young child, his mother and his grandmother taught him the Bible, brought him up in the Bible. Now, we might not have had the same influences in our life. I'm sure that if we asked everyone here for their testimony, everyone would have a different story of how they learned about God, of how they came to know Christ. My testimony is I got saved around the age of four with my father in our car one night after uh, an evening service. I'm sure each one of you has a different testimony. And that testimony doesn't just end at salvation. There's the story of our lives, our spiritual walk ever since. And those will be filled with ups and downs, times where we're close to God, times where we're uh, further away from God, times of obedience, times of re rebellion. Each one of us has a very unique and um, different story, a special story. But each and every one of us needs this command, this exhortation in our lives. Continue. The, the idea of continue is just keep going. Stay, or stay where you are. Stay doing what you're doing. Stay in what you know. Continue in what you have learned. What you have been assured of. We need to continue... Um, being assured that God's word is the truth. We've been assured of this throughout our lives. Every Sunday you come in and we, uh, pastor speaks and preaches, God's word is truth. This is what it says. This is how we apply it to our lives. Continue in that. Continue believing. The reason why the beginning part of the chapter is important to this is because Paul just comes away from saying, beware of bad influences. Reject the bad influences that will lead you away from God. For the sake of time, we're not going to read through all the verses, but verses 1 through 10 basically uh, outline the fact that in the end times, in the last days, in the times between when Christ goes up and when He comes again, there are going to be men who are going to lead or attempt to lead Christians away from God. They're going to teach uh, false gospels. They're going to be proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. The, there's a whole slew of descriptions in, those, in the first few verses that describe these People who try to lead Christians away from the truth, the pure truth of God's gospel. Paul then says in verse 10, 
that Timothy's fully known his doctrine, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, and patience. And he goes on to say, Timothy, you've seen from my example what a godly life is. Continue in that. Reject the bad influences, but follow the good influences in your life that lead you to God. And that's what he's saying. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. The, what you have learned, what you already know, what has been taught to is truth, what you've been assured of repeatedly. Keep holding faith in that. Because these, this is what brings you to salvation. The end of verse 15. The holy scriptures were able to make, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Instead of following the examples that lead you away from faith, follow those that direct you towards faith in God and faith in Christ and in the pure instruction. Because God's word is the only true guide to life. Psalm 115, verse 105 is very familiar to us, I'm sure. Thy word, the Bible, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's what shows me the way. It's what shows me how to live, how to make decisions that are godly, that have godly and eternal impacts, both in my life, in the lives of those around us, and in the world as a whole. One of the things that um, my school tries to teach, that Maranatha tries to teach, is to be a student le uh, servant leader. They teach about, uh, they, they talk about how um, you can lead through example, even if you have no idea that you're doing it. And I've been surprised sometimes by um, the people who come up to me while I'm working. I, I worked, I believe I mentioned this before, but um, the first two summers while I was in the States, I worked a factory job in Pennsylvania. And it's a noisy factory. There's not a whole lot of opportunity for interaction. But I still got comments from people around me saying, you're different. Why are you like this? Why are you acting the way you are? Why don't you do these things that we enjoy doing? Why don't you speak in this way? Why don't you uh, have this work ethic? Why aren't you uh, attracted to these things? The, we affect people. We influence people even though we don't even realize it. So continue following God's word. Keep doing what this book tells you to do. That's first of all, that's the first thing we see. Continue in God's Word. Secondly, we need to learn from God's Word. Verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration. God's Word is important because it is inspired by Him. Now, the word inspiration has the idea of breathed out. The idea that it came from God directly. And we have it. Stop and consider with me, if you would, please. Think about... How wonderful that thought is. That the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, creator God, founder of the heavens and the earth, creator of me, designer of me, designer of you, the one who has a perfect plan for the universe, took the time to communicate to humanity, sinful humanity, fallen humanity, who has rejected him time and time again, but he took the time to communicate in a way that we can all understand. One of the beautiful things about the Bible is that it can be understood by any person at any age, whether a child or even uh, an adult. It has a simplicity that even a young child can grasp and a complexity that an adult can revel in even years after hearing the same thing. I know it's so much fun to read a passage that I have read a dozen times, but something just pops out, something that is either super applicable to what I'm going through right now, or maybe it's a, a new thing uh, that's not new, but that is new to me, that just refreshes my soul. It's just refreshing to learn continually, even if it's something that I've read, that I've studied multiple times. 
that all comes from this book being inspired by God. And it's not only inspired, it's also profitable. It has value. It's profitable for doctrine. That word simply means to be taught. It's profitable for reproof. That means to show us what is wrong in our lives. For correction, to adjust our lives to better fit what uh, the Bible teaches, what God wants of us. And for instruction in righteousness, to show us how to go in the future. So it's profitable to be taught, but if we flip that a little bit, it's profitable to learn from. If it's worth being taught, if it's, worth, if it's profitable for doctrine, then it's profitable to take it in, to study it, to learn from it, to glean everything I can. If it can show what is wrong with a person's life, then shouldn't I look to it to show me what's wrong with my own? If it can correct, couldn't, shouldn't I look to it to show me how I should do better in the future? If it can instruct me in how to live in God's way, shouldn't I try to live that as best as I can on a daily basis? I love uh, using the illustration of a father teaching his son to drive. Dad, dad is the one who taught me to drive, mostly because mom uh, was too afraid to. Um, but in that process, we have to use every single one of these steps. My father first had to teach me, all right, what does this do? What does that do? When you first get in the car, do you, check, you check your mirrors and you uh, buckle your seatbelt and you make sure the door is closed. You make sure your passengers are in and secured. And then you start the car. And then when I do something wrong, my father's there to say, no, don't do that. That's wrong. That's a bad thing. That's going to get you really hurt. Instead, do this. So you can do it better in the future. And this is how you keep going so that you don't have this problem, this difficulty in the future. The Bible should do that to our lives. It should show us how to live on a daily basis. Not only that, not only do we need to learn from God's Word, we also need to grow in God's Word. Now this passage shows us Two ways, two areas in our life that God's word should change us. It should change us both internally and externally. Verse 17, that the, word, the man of God may be perfect. That's the internal change. The word perfect simply means complete. Entire. Every part is there. The Bible should have an impact on your personal spiritual life, the part that no one else sees. It should affect you when no one else is around. It should be part of your time in prayer every day that no one else is ever going to hear. The internal change. And this is partially the work of the Spirit. In fact, it's a large part of the work of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What it's saying is, when we look into God's Word, and we see God's character, and we see what we're supposed to do, the Spirit works in our life to change us, to grow us, to be more like Christ. That's, part of the, that's the major part of the function of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does in our life. This morning we briefly mentioned the fact that He's the proof of our um, salvation. That's in, shown in Ephesians 1, and that's a large part of His work. But the other major part, uh, the other two other major parts are the illumination of God's Word, the fact that He shows us the truth from God's Word so that we can understand it, and also the fact that He changes us based on that truth. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility in this process too. We have a responsibility to work on changing our lives to reflect God and reflect Christ. Paul tells us this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We have a responsibility to depart from the iniquity, the sins in our life. 
goes on to say, but in a great house, he uses the illustration of a house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. In a house, in a building, there are vessels, there are things, furniture or, or pottery or things that have value, things that are useful. This pulpit has value. It is useful. It holds up my, book very, my Bible very well. And there are things that are not good, not useful. My office has a trash can, and that trash can is filled with Trash. That trash doesn't serve anyone a purpose. So, what he's saying in verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet to the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What he's saying is, there are things in your life that do not bring honor to God. They are trash in your life. And there are things of your life that do. They are useful. They are good. So, take out the trash and keep that which is good. Keep the useful things and use them. Bring glory to God through them. And by that, you're prepared unto every good work. And that brings us to the second change that we see in our life. Uh, verse 17, the second half, says, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All good works. And works is an active thing, something that we're actively doing, something that is being performed in our life. I like to uh, cross-reference when I'm studying with the Spanish Bible. As you know, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and we speak Spanish. We preach in Spanish, and uh, we study the Spanish Bible. And the Spanish Bible usually is almost identical to the English, but every once in a while, because of the words being that, that were picked in its translation, um, it can help add an extra dimension of color to the uh, to what's being written, to what was written. So it uses the phrase um, entirely prepared. It's a direct translation from the Spanish. Enteramente preparado. It's actually funny because when I memorized this passage, I memorized verses 14 through 16 in English, and then I cannot for the life of me remember what verse 17 is in English, and it always comes out in Spanish. Um, a fin de que el hombre de Dios sea perfecto, enteramente preparado, preparado para toda buena obra. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly prepared for every good work. And that should be the change that is visible, that people see in our lives. They should see us acting out the change that the Holy Spirit has already done. If, God, if, if the Holy Spirit is working on our lives, developing us to show love to our neighbor our neighbor should be able to tell that we're loving. Our co-workers who are not saved should be able to tell that there's a difference. That we display these characteristics of Christianity that the world doesn't have. That we have a depth of character that is impossible without God's work in our life. So we need to be faithful to God's Word by continuing in it as our guide to life. We need to learn from it as our source of truth. And we need to change according to the glory of Christ that we see displayed in it. So we need to act out God's Word. We need to live it. it kind of ties into this morning talking about uh, if you are children of light, act as children of light. Walk as children of light. Let the light be displayed in you, reflected through you. The Christian life is not passive. We can't just sit back and be backseat uh, couch potato Christians and expect that God will be pleased with our efforts. We have to put effort in. It's like the parable of the talents, where the master left, uh, Jesus tells this parable, where the master uh, left his servants, and he gave each one different abilities, different gifts. Um, in the parable, it's money, but we often take the word talent and apply it in the, in the modern day sense. He gave each servant a portion of money and said, use this wisely. And every servant that used what God gave him Effectively, the master came back 
and blessed him for it. But the servant who didn't use it, the master came back and took it away. Now, it's not to say that you can lose your salvation. We know we can't. But what ability has God given you to serve that you might not be able to continue to use in the future if you don't use it now? We need to act out what we learn from this book. So what's our conclusion? What should we take away from this? How should this affect our life on a daily basis? First of all, we need to be actively studying God's rule book. One of uh, the games that I really enjoy was introduced to me a couple years ago by some college buddies, and we got a group of college friends together who will play it regularly. It has some rather, rather complicated rules sometimes, and the w only way to... Um, understand what all is happening all the time is to be continuously studying because there are a whole bunch of different situations that might pop up. So we have to be continually studying and reading the rules and making sure that what we're doing is correct. And sometimes we have to go and say, nope, that's not right. We have to redo that or that's not right. Now we know for next time. We need to study our rules for life on a daily basis. Make sure they're fresh in our mind so we can act out according to them, act according to them. We need, we need to search for the truth that should correct and change the way we act. If we go through our day and uh, we realize that we're in bad temper and the Bible shows us, God shows us through um, whatever our reading is, that that's not correct. We need to be willing to confront that in our lives and say, I know that I sinned. I'm sorry, Lord, and I'm sorry those who I harmed for my sin. Let me change that and let me not live according to that in the future. Let me put that away from me. Purge that unclean vessel. Throw out the trash. And we need to pray that the Spirit shows us how to live like Christ. Many people have read the Bible and come away with nothing because they weren't actively looking for ways to allow the Spirit to affect their life. We need to be willing and open to let, letting the Spirit do its work, do His work in our life. And finally, we need to do. We need to do it. We need to not be passive. We need to be active in living this on a daily basis. So, it's a little bit early. Um, I think I'm making up for this morning a little bit. But let's pray, and uh, then we'll close out the service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful gift, your book, your instruction manual for life. I pray that we would take it seriously and live according to it, and that it would be important in our life. Lord, I thank you for the work of the Spirit and its direction and its guidance. I pray that we would allow it to have a work in our life, allow it to change us to be like Christ. In your name I pray, amen.